from Trimble Construction, you're listening to the Connected Construction Show, where we connect you to the contractors, owners, designers, engineers, and construction professionals who are finding better ways to work. And now, here's your host, Matt Sprague. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Connected Construction Show. I'm your host, Matt Sprague. Uh, thankful for all of you tuning back in, watching, listening for you first timers. Fantastic to have you this week. We have Brady Markell, who is the director of marketing and business development for street smart Brady. Welcome to the show. Yeah, Matt. Thanks for having me. So this is, um, we're, we're, we're kind of going off, off the rails a little bit in that, um, it's a area of connected construction that I bet many people don't take into consideration, which is street smart and what they provide. Before we get there, though, um, we like to learn about you, the person, uh, the, the, the character, the, the, the person with the experience uh, in, the, in the industry. So, Brady, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I always start by telling people I'm, I'm just a farm kid from southern Minnesota, so you got to kind of talk really slow. And uh, if you haven't heard it in my um, voice by now, some people think I'm from Canada. So that, that thick Minnesotan accent, um, farm kid. So I kind of, uh, you know, learned at an early age how to just figure stuff out and, um, you know, eventually made my way through college. And oddly enough, um, Matt worked at a Caterpillar dealership. Uh, installing Trimble GPS systems, uh, one of the first dealers to do so back in the early 2000s. So uh, love seeing that Trimble name around. Um, I know this show is much more than just, you know, what you guys are doing, just how uh, people are leveraging technology in general in construction. So that's kind of um, what I've made my career now. And, and we'll get into that in depth. But basically, uh, Street Smart exists to make highway work zones safer for both the motorists and for the workers. So um, excited to to tell you more. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks thanks for joining us again. And uh, with being uh, a kid from the Northeast, <laughs> paired now with a kid from the Midwest, I will try to slow myself down because <laughs> we're 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 at opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, good. Uh, my wife, in particular, she she's an optometrist, and a lot of her patients are always like, "Can you please slow down?" <laughs> We're, 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 we're innately fast up in these parts. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll work together and make it, make it work today. So, um, enough about me. Sorry. I digress. I went off on a tangent there. The, um, street smart. So yeah. let's, let's talk about that. What, what is, what is street smart? Tell, tell our, tell our, uh, our listeners a little bit more. Sure. So we're a, we're a very niche rental company. And what I mean by that is we have a sole focus on, um, traffic control products, particularly more expensive uh, trailerized traffic control equipment. So things like electronic message signs, aero boards, portable traffic signals, uh, vehicle data collection sensors, all that orange stuff you see when you're driving through the work zone, whether it's out on the freeway, freeway or even around town. Um, we rent that to the companies that deploy it, and we do that nationwide. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, so it's a lot of right now as it, as it pertains to connected construction, it's, it, it's having to do with the, the IOT piece of, of connected construction. Yep. So not uh, so much the, the software that helps them with project management or design or, 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 or building, but it's some of the IOT feeds right. that help inform. Is that yep. a good way of categorizing yep. it? It's a good way to, to say it. Now, of those devices I just mentioned, uh, we, we put a cellular modem in, in all of them. And so that allows the end user and even the DOTs to uh, get at and program this information remotely. So somebody doesn't need to be standing at the trailer to, for example, change the sign, change what the message is saying. So we've all driven through those work zones that might say 10 miles, 20 minutes. But then an hour later, it says 10 miles, 33 minutes. So it's, it's the technology we're using um, in these systems that allows that sign to refresh in real time. So we're putting the motorist 
um, kind of giving them as much real-time information as we can to put them at ease as they're approaching that work zone, ultimately making them a safer driver, safer for the contractor. Yeah, so that that's kind of a piece that I wanted to get into is yeah. that, so uh, is it safe to say you're, are you are you contracting with the contractors or directly with the DOTs? Yep, or that's a good question. Uh, it depends is, is the answer. So a lot of times, uh, Street Smart almost becomes a subcontractor to the primary traffic control provider on the job. Those are the guys out setting the orange uh, plastic barrels and the drums. We don't rent or um, own any of that equipment. They come to us for the more specialized uh, sensors and uh, message boards if they need them. Um, and then also on some of the larger projects, and some states have chosen to take a more holistic approach to work zone safety, where they will actually hire a statewide um, contractor to put these more specialty devices in work zones to uh, ensure they're having a consistent delivery and management of those systems. Um, that is cases where we do work directly with the DOT as, as our customer. So, um, and no matter who the customer is, yep. you mentioned safety. Are yep. there are there uh, correlated productivity benefits to the to this type of technology as well? Yeah, great question. So, um, one story I like to use uh, revolves around data collection. So, most of the time on a typical road construction job, they do traffic studies. Obviously, sometimes years ahead of time to figure out okay, what's the impact going to be. Um, when we deploy a portable trailer with a data collection device on it, we're getting real-time traffic information. So whether that's 100 cars a day or 150,000 vehicles per day, we can get down to the minute, lane by lane, occupancy, the types of vehicles, and really get at that data, deliver that back to our customer, whether it's the DOT or the construction company, whomever, and that allows them to sometimes make on the fly decisions. And, and one example would be if they're planning to, let's see, condense the highway from four lanes down to two lanes overnight and do a bunch of work from 10 p.m. till five in the morning, if we can give them enough data to show them, boy, instead of waiting until 10 to start, you could start at 8.30, that's a big deal when you can you know, add an hour and a half to a project for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. So. Um, we've had documented instances where our information was able to help, um, you know, bring the project uh, to completion much more quickly and and under budget just based on the data. Just based on the data. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so there's safety. Yep. So that's just so so there the 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 public awareness in 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 adherence to to speed restrictions due to due, due to construction zones and things like mm -hmm. that productivity mm -hmm. that you just talked about are there are there other benefits or there are there benefits that are are particular to like the stakeholder like the contractor experiences x the owner gets y uh the public gets z yeah um or are they all similar I think, yeah, they're all similar. I think everybody kind of shares in some of the benefits of these systems, um, you know, all the way down to, and it sounds crazy, but like local fire departments. And, and you're thinking, well, what does he mean? Um, if there's a if there's a tight, you know, temporary lane that has to get created with concrete jersey barrier, and that fire department's you know 45 foot rig can't navigate that turn. That's where these kind of frequent stakeholder meetings come in. And, and we have these larger scale project where, um, you know, and it sounds kind of cliche, but everybody has a seat at the table, right? Every week in, in kind of a um, stakeholder meeting to say, okay, what's going on this week in terms of the construction? You know, is there anything impacted that's going to uh, potentially negatively impact response times for emergency fire, EMS, uh, state patrol, things like that. So in some of the, kind of most successful projects that we look back on, it's those weekly check-in meetings, you know, 15 people sitting around the table, might be a 20 minute meeting, um, it, but but it's cool because you can deliver kind of real-time changes, right? If the meeting's at nine and the fire captain's saying, we need this done by one o'clock, stuff gets done. It's fun to be part of that. Yeah, so there's, it. it's interesting now, like to kind of come back to connected construction yep. is where we're, the technology that you're providing is expanding the scope 
of who is involved in connected right. construction. Like you just said, like, you know, like yeah. safety services, we have the police and, and, and the fire emer- emergency services, yeah. um, which have never, I, well, at least my experience, I've, I haven't thought of that that far. So it's interesting that it, it, it expands out in the, in those scenarios. Yeah. And when it comes to those meetings that you just mentioned, yeah. um, is that something that street smart helps too? So you have like a consulting portion of what you provide as well. Yep. So we do um, some consulting on our own, obviously these larger um, highway projects, there's uh, usually a third party traffic engineering consulting firm, some of which, you know, the projects get big enough to justify their own communications director. So they're sending real time um, construction updates out through the various social media channels. Um, That's also where the, the ability for us to remotely program our message boards and put them on schedules um, also, you know, comes very critical because if there's a weekend, let's say music festival, we want those signs to say something very different on, let's say, Friday evening leading into that weekend than we might on Monday when it's all the way when it's going to be over. And again, not requiring people to make the visit out to, you know, one to three to 30 different message boards. It's all yeah. done behind the scenes, um, you mentioned software earlier. Yeah, all of this is kind of controlled with with a centralized software, like most things these days, um, making it automated and very easy. So are there DOTs that are also (laughs) utilizing this for for planning purposes? So not necessarily a project in mind, but like, surveying is the wrong, wrong word here, but just getting an idea of what the traffic patterns are and yep. based on is the infrastructure set up to carry the demand. Yep, absolutely. Now, the vast majority of DOTs, particularly in major metropolitan areas, have permanent mounted vehicle data collection devices. That's how they're updating, you know, their 511 systems and things like that. But, you know, in, you know, some of the more rural areas, uh, we're able to set up these temporary solar powered trailers that have modems in them, in them and um, they're self powered with batteries and solar to get at that same level of information that you know you can get at in those major metropolitan areas. And then obviously when you're doing any major project, that permanent infrastructure is often removed as a, as a condition of the job, right? They gotta widen the road. So the pole that that thing used to be mounted on isn't there. So um, you know, we have projects that there might be five trailers with data collection and message boards. We have also some projects that have several hundred trailers. It's all um, can be size and scope based on the type of project. <clears throat> so you mentioned like most most major metropolitan areas have have things that are that are mounted permanently. Yeah. Yep. Um, have you seen a, a trend due mm-hmm. to due to COVID? where people were leaving metropolitan areas, that there's now a need for uh, increased infrastructure in other areas that maybe didn't necessarily have all of that technology set up? Yeah, great question. Um, (laughs) Yes, is the short answer to that. Um, Some examples of that would be when uh, none of us could go into the office and everybody seemed to take family road trips. Uh, We got a lot of requests in and around the national parks, for example. So, you know, suddenly oh. they're going from, you know, we used to have a few thousand visitors a day to now, like you need to buy tickets weeks and ahead of time because af- after 12 o'clock noon, we'd stop letting people into the park. So, um, you know, vehicle data collection came in handy there as did things like our portable traffic signals. So, you know, suddenly you're in, uh, you know, Western South Dakota or out in Montana, Wyoming, and there's this influx of vehicles at a, uh, a four-way stop. Well, that doesn't work anymore. So uh, portable traffic signals would be another example of, you know, some innovative technologies that would allow the area to be safer and more efficient for everyone. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And what about, um, this is more, uh, more, more current events, but uh, sure. Hurricane Ian and yep. Florida and whatnot, are they, or so just in general, like does disaster responses and whatnot are do you yeah. do you see your technology needing to be deployed into those scenarios to help yeah, we do and um you know obviously florida is is um very well versed in hurricanes um 
they set up their roadways so that when the need comes, all traffic can go northbound. So they leverage permanent mount message signs that we've all seen mounted to the overpasses. And really it's, it's the same type of um, backend software that they use to remotely program all those message boards. Um, and they're using data collection too, to, to see, okay, in real time, are people moving like we thought they would, or do we need to do something differently? You know, obviously in the, in the coming weeks, I'm sure we're going to get um, bombarded with requests for solar powered camera trailers, for example, so people can have eyes on the sky, what's going on in my area. Um, again, message boards, portable traffic signals, all devices that can run as long as the sun is shining and you have um, some cellular connection, um, doesn't need a generator, doesn't need permanent power to run. So, gotcha, gotcha. So prior um, prior to the show, to the record, recording today, we've yep. had a discussion, and and you were talking about a few particular projects um, mm -hmm. that that you guys worked on that that were that were significant and whatnot. I'd yep. love for you to kind of share the, sure. share those stories. I think there was one in Colorado you mentioned. Yeah. Yep. So one out in Colorado, um, Kramer, North America was the general contractor on that project. And it's the stretch of highway just South of, of Denver. It's referred to as the gap I 25. Uh, it's between Castle Rock and uh, Colorado Springs area, about a 20 mile stretch um, ended up being about a three year project. Um, and it started out, one of the initial requests was the deployment of what we call trucks uh, egress or ingress systems. So the ability to notify the public, the motoring public on that stretch of roadway, that there's something coming up up ahead and it's a slow moving construction vehicle of some kind. So they either need to you know, shift a lane right or shift a lane left to allow that slow moving vehicle to get up to speed on the highway. Um, I forget the exact number, but at one point, you know, on that job, they had something like uh, maybe 60 haul trucks entering the main line, the interstate, every four to five minutes or something like that. Just a, an insane amount of, of slow moving, you know, fully loaded trucks entering onto a stretch of highway that sees, I believe, uh, over 80,000 vehicles a day. So we were able to successfully deploy those systems. Um, and then it just kind of continued to expand on, on kind of the different systems that they wanted StreetSmart to help deploy. Now, a lot of that was a result of our team meeting with the DOT uh, a year or two or three prior to that large job, just to educate them on, hey, this is what's available for you to use in the market, you know, whether it's from StreetSmart or whomever. It's not some futuristic software or technology. It's here and it's here now. And you should think about it on these larger, longer duration projects. So um, truck entry system kind of morphed into a queue warning system. So we're telling the motorists, you know, slow or stop traffic two miles ahead based on, again, vehicle data collection. It gets getting recorded within the work zone. That project also had several of those um, solar powered cameras that I mentioned allowing the DOT to have real-time video feed into their uh, temporary on-site um, traffic uh, command center so they can dispatch uh, uh, emergency vehicles, uh, tow trucks, things like that, clear them out of that work zone, making it safer for everyone. Uh, we also had a number of radar speed feedback trailers and variable speed limit signs. So kind of the first of its kind, giving the ability for the project team to lower or uh, raise the speed limits in that 20 mile stretch as conditions dictated. So an example would be, you know, again, we're taking the highway from three lanes down to two and we're doing overnight work. Let's, let's take that speed. Usually it's 60 down to 50. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but 10 miles an hour is a lot. So it's these large trailers, portable, you know, LED lights, very high visibility. Um, showing the new speed limit and then also flashing the current uh, driver's speed at them. So I can tell you, having been out there at night and standing by one of those trailers, when the motorists see their speed flashed at them, there's instant brake lights. So we had some very good uh, unsolicited feedback from the state patrol officer who kind of oversaw that entire corridor. Um, and he told me he'd been working 
you know, out in that area and on these large construction jobs in particular for the last 20 years. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, this project is by far the largest he's ever been on, but also the safest at the same time. And, and he attributed most, much of that to some of these devices that I was uh, just mentioning. So it's honestly hearing that and combined with, um, and I, I'd have to double check, but up until recently, <clears throat> There were, <clears throat> excuse me, there were zero documented fatalities in that work zone uh, as you know, that had anything to do with the actual construction activity. Now there's the normal, you know, somebody hits a guardrail or something like that. But yeah. um, in terms of the safety, I believe, you know, we had a small part in, there's nothing more rewarding than that, um, particularly given the size and scope of that project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are there, are there like, nationwide statistics in terms of what uh, per percentage of, yeah. of, of accidents per traffic flow during construction zones? And uh, have, you, have you been able to put together uh, enough data to show that, hey, deploying a full-on yeah. suite of systems helps reduce it by X percent? Right. Yeah. I wish there was, you know, one kind of number or answer to that. Um, there's been a number of universities that have done, you know, expensive studies, you know, Texas A&M and Purdue, some uh, Iowa State that have dedicated uh, traffic research teams. And there's some good data there, you know, and it varies, you know, maybe a cue warning system, it, it can reduce uh, rear end collisions is basically, you know, the number one leading uh, cause of fatalities in work zones. Yep. Um, it reduced, you know, Q warning system might reduce rear end collisions anywhere from 20 to 80%. You think, well, wow, that's a, that's a wide gap, right? But again, it's all relative to the actual project. Cause if I'm down in, you know, Lake Charles, Louisiana, where there's a ton of <clears throat> overpasses and maybe blind curves and things like that, that's a much differently designed system yeah. than the project I just referenced in Colorado, where it's a straight shot down I-25. So, you know, the statistic that really hits up, hits home to us is, you know, over the last five years, on average, there's two people per day that are killed in highway work zone crashes, right? Most of those are preventable. Now, obviously, thousands die every day on the road in crashes, but particularly highway work zones, uh, two two fatalities per day is is what we're averaging. Wow. Yeah. Excellent. So what's what's the what's the future of this technology? What do you what do you envision? Maybe it's maybe it's your own yeah. your own brain, or maybe the the companies in general. Like, what what are the plans? Yeah, well, what what I've seen, you know, just in the last five years in particular, is kind of the the race from the manufacturers to kind of stay at parity with one another. And really, what that's doing is kind of um, you know it's forcing each of them. We're not a manufacturer; we go out and find you know best in class products and put it into our rental fleet. But it's, it's forcing those manufacturers to kind of compete with one another and, and making sure this kind of automated push of information is just the, part of their standard offering. It used to be you had to retrofit, but now it's coming off the assembly line with that baked in, which is not uncommon for a lot of technologies and vehicles and construction equipment, things like that. Um, you know, obviously, everybody wants to talk about um, automated vehicles and things like that. Um, which is great, but they're always going to have a challenge um, navigating um, temporary highway striping, temporary lane closures and lane shifts, things like that. So that just stresses the importance of the ability of equipment like we've been discussing to basically send its information to the cloud and allow these different technologies to consume the data. Hey, I'm a work zone and I'm, it starts here and it ends here. Well, that's <clears throat> being able to get at that information is a big deal. Yep. Um, for some of these these automotive companies that are baking <clears throat> all of this right into the car. So um, the ability to push this to Waze and Google Maps, that's been there now for a number of years, but, but how do we take it to the next level and get it into the vehicle? So that's kind of some discussions that are happening in the, in the industry right now, and, and it's exciting. But, you know, I, I personally don't see the need for um, these large message signs is seemingly archaic as those might seem now with uh, all the technology advancements. I don't see those going away anytime soon because it seems like the more stuff we put in cars, sometimes the more distracted the driver becomes. So 
you need to, like I say, kind of hit them over the head with it, right? A huge uh, five foot by nine sign, you know, along the side of, side of the road is hard to miss, especially when it's providing uh, updated and relevant information. And that's, that's key. You have to show them what's happening now. Uh, we live in a world of instant gratification. So a sign that just says caution workers present and it doesn't change for three years, that does nothing for anybody. Yeah, no, I, I, my, I'm, I'm glad you said that in terms of like needing to have the external notification there, because um, I know my car has the, 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 the heads up display. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I have my, my, uh, my, my speed there and the speed limit. But to be honest with you, yeah. now that you said it, like I, it was like realization, right. I don't ever like it's now it's just become something that's there. And I always just look right by it. So even if, 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 if your technology was feeding my car and displayed yeah. it on heads up, yeah. I've kind of programmed myself that I just see, see past it. Right. Um, I think the only thing would be is that if it was uh, all of a sudden Siri started talking to me or something like that, but well, like, Hey, yeah, Matthew, and that's, watch out. It's there. <laughs> you know, I, I think back to, to my first car, 80 in 83 Buick LeSabre, grandpa's old car. That thing <laughs> was about 40 feet long. And I had this radar detector um, don't tell the cops of Lyon County, yeah, right? Minnesota, <laughs> illegal in Minnesota, but I think I got it at a garage sale, but think about that. What is that doing? Well, that's notifying you of a cop that's up ahead. Well, now we're notifying you of a work zone that's up ahead, right? There's people yeah. working up there and, and there's something that's changed based on what you're maybe not used to. So that technology is absolutely there. I mentioned the integration with Waze and Google maps. So instead of saying, Hey, um, you know, police officer reported ahead, it's, hey, work zone up ahead, left lanes closed, open your eyes and pay attention, basically. So Yeah, no, it's great. It's helping feed, feeding all those things, because even that helps with rerouting traffic right. without having to having to worry worry about it. Now, granted, yeah. ex exist if you're a wazer, uh, yeah. you know, that you're helping feed that, that things are slow and it'll it will di divert it. But it'd be great to have <clears throat> data before. Yep. <laughs> people are actually stuck in it and that helps even more. So right. that's awesome. Yep. So, so we're, um, we're down to the last question, okay. um, which is a question we ask all of our guests, so which is, uh, what is, what is your motto? What's, uh, or if you don't have a personal motto, cause not every human being has their own personal motto, yeah. but what's a motto that you've heard that you've taken a lesson in life from? Yeah. Um, I, I work with a, with a traffic safety engineer. Um, he is a former DOT employee and he said something a couple of years ago that stuck out. He's a huge advocate for these systems that we've been talking about. And his biggest thing is, um, guys, don't wait to do these systems. Like don't put a committee together and maybe do one in two years. You know, these have been around since the early 2000s. He, he likens it to if, if you had a house and it was full of mice, what, you know, you wouldn't sit down and try and design a mouse trap, right? You'd go to Home Depot and buy them for 98 cents and start catching mice. And that's really applicable to what we've just talked about is this is not some futuristic thing. And, it, and I'd love to sit here and say, you know, this is being used in the vast majority of work zones today. It's not. It's still a very small percentage of the overall total. And, and obviously that excites us. But what's happened year over year is the economics of this have decreased. It's not as expensive as it used to be. So um, the education piece is so huge. Um, a lot of people kind of didn't know that how these systems work. So that's part of our job is just educating and, and, and making sure people aren't starting from scratch with that mousetrap using what's been proven. I like it. I like yeah. it. I, and that just brought up, so I, I'm going to be a bit of a fibber. I do have another sure. question or, or a thought from um, the, uh, 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 bipartisan infrastructure law. Yep. Is there, uh, are, are there pieces built into that for infrastructure development and safety, uh, safety uh, expenses? Yep. Good question. I know, I think they carved out about uh, at least a hundred million of that, which is a drop in the bucket in the grand scheme of things um, specific to like innovative um, ideas and kind of technology like this um, that States can go after. Now that might be a, one to six month pilot project of some kind that people are going to apply for. Right. But the systems that we've been kind of talking about the queue warning, the truck entry, things like that, um, Matt, those are becoming biddable line items on a highway job. Yep. And so 
when the DOT knows they want these things and they, they, they know the benefits of these systems um, are providing, just like they're saying we need, um, you know, 2,000 cones for 1,000 days on this project, they're specking in, we need a truck entry system for 1,000 days and a queue warning system for 700 of those days, things like that. So It's good. It's good yeah. that, that that's being part of the out of, of the spec. So, yep. Well, well, Brady, thank you so much uh, for joining us again. Uh, Brady Markell, Director of Marketing and Business Development for Street Smart. Really appreciate you sharing with us uh, the technology that you're providing and the benefits that it's providing to not only uh, the, the the DOTs but the public as well. So, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome, Matt. It's been a pleasure and, and thank you for what you're doing. This is awesome. Oh, thank you. And uh, everybody listening, everybody watching, thank you so much for checking us out again. We'll look forward to our next show with you. And until next time, stay connected. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Construction Show. For more information, visit us at connectedconstructionshow.com.